All right, good morning, and welcome to our STEM lecture for today. My name is Brian Kurtz from the Mathematics Department. STEM, as you may know, stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. And I am very excited to introduce our speaker, our first speaker for the semester, Dr. Kalyan Mutiala, who comes to us from Argonne National Laboratory, where he is a postdoctoral science at the Center for Nanoscale Materials. Dr. Mutiala has a PhD in tribology from the University of Akron, also holds an MBA, and he was a mechanical engineering major. <laughs> Dr. Mutiala will speak for about 40 to 50 minutes or so, and there should be some time for questions at the end. So without further ado, I give you Dr. Mutiala. Thank you, Brian. It is wonderful to be here and sharing my research, core research area with uh, very young generation of students. And I just learned that this, is, this event kickstarts the number of events for the whole semester, and I, I should be uh, very thankful for giving me this opportunity to uh, Modern Valley Community College as well as coordinating with me, Brian. And uh, today I'm going to talk about tribology and, and to begin with, what is your first impression when you heard this word, tribology? Okay. And I am. I prefer to have a uh, in more kind of interactive talk. So I'll appreciate if everyone will try to participate. And uh, once I did study of tribes and any any other guesses. All right. Today my. Goal is to show you tribology is everywhere. In other words, as I said, let's see if it is going to be a tri study of tribes or something else. Before I kick start uh, talking about tribology, I would like to give you an overview of Oregon National Laboratory. And I'm sure you might have heard about Argonne a, a lot. I have seen uh, previously some lectures uh, given by Argonne researchers or scientists here. And Argonne is a, a national lab uh, that is operated by U Chicago for Department of Energy. And at any given point of time, you will see around 3,000 employees, and 50% of them are researchers and scientists. And what is interesting here is the around 7,000 facility users. Users in the sense uh, they can be from any college in US or any university or across the world, you know, from France, Russia, China, India, uh, wherever they can come to Oregon and use, this, uh, use the user facilities. So at any given point of time, you'll see a uh, number that appears to be like around 10,000 people associated with Oregon. And what do we do or wh what is the impact we drive at Oregon is we study atomic level science with a focus to impact on a large scale across the nation as well as across the world. And when it comes to the Oregon research areas, if you're wondering what is it, uh, the three fundamental core areas, one is energy, the second is environment, and the third is the national security. When it comes to energy, I'll give you a couple of examples what we work, what has Argon worked on. Traditionally, Argon has a very big group of researchers who works on regular uh, engine-based automotives, but it is not the case. Now we have also a lithium-ion battery uh, research facility, very, very big group. And if you happen to see a Chevy Volt, the technology that is used for that vehicle is, has been developed at Oregon. And the second is environment. Oregon researchers do study about the impact on the environment and the weather patterns uh, for various research purposes. 
to understand how the changes in one region is going to affect a coastal area or like in you know, the Midwest or Southeast or what are across the world. And this one, this is we call it oleo sponge. And what do you think when you think of a sponge? Something absorbing, yeah. What does it absorbs? Liquids. Uh, can it absorb oil? Yes. Okay. So this is the uh, US development, our uh, big breakthrough from argon. We call it oleo sponge. This sponge, if you dip it in water, it is not going to take the water. It is not going to soak water. It is not going to absorb water. But it is going. What it is going to do is, it is going to absorb only the oil. And the beauty of this technology is, you can actually absorb the oil and take it out and squeeze in in other utensils or vessel and you can reprocess and reuse the oil. This is a big breakthrough because if you heard of oil spillage in uh, seas by you know petroleum companies and it is a big money saver for them. Not only they can recover the oil, they can actually use, reuse that one. So uh, there is a big impact. And uh, Department of Energy Lab, so we mostly work on energy related technologies for uh, this is like a thermal plant like uh, cooling tower and it is not only restricted to energy uh, energy related we also work on the technologies that is you know uh, for the chip based or like a, whatever it is driving us now like computers and what is the fundamental building blocks of those technological uh, components and national security. This is also one of the uh, big push uh, uh, at Argon that is not really uh, known by looking at the Argon because it is always at the Department of Energy lab. So people think that is we only work on energy, but we also work on uh, national security related uh, issues, and as well as renewable energy, which is like a wind turbine or you know how how can we harness the energy uh, by not really impacting the environment where we are living in. And at least, and uh, derive the same uh, energy levels from the air or from uh, tidal waves, and other stuff. All right, this is bit brief about argon. Argon has a number of divisions, like around twenty divisions. And I come from a, uh, a facility called Center for Nanoscale Materials, where uh, it is a use big user facility, and people can uh, come from across the nation or all over the world and come and work with us, collaborate with us and uh, use the facility for free uh, uh, for the scientific endeavors. And this is not the only uh, center for nanoscale materials across the nation. There are uh, Department of Energy Office of Science established five uh, center for nanoscale materials, uh, nanoscale material focused labs uh, at five national labs and one is at Argonne. And the research direction now at Oregon CNM is uh, based uh, towards quantum materials and phenomena and manipulating the nanoscale interactions and uh, as well synthesis of nano architectures for energy information and functionality. And how do we do that? We have a five core groups now within CNM uh, who works on different areas like quantum and energy materials and uh, nanophotonics and biofunctional structures and nanofabrication and devices. This is the group I am coming from. Uh, theory and modeling and electron and X-ray microscopy group. It doesn't mean that uh, I am, because I am from NFD, I, I don't uh, really work with the other groups. Or I, uh, I, in Argon is a culture where you are encouraged to collaborate. and. Uh, science has now uh, up to a level where you need to collaborate. There is uh, uh, no single measure that can solve a, a single problem nowadays. So you definitely need a, multitude, a variety of background people and you have to uh, do the experimental science as well as uh, the support of theory and modeling. You can actually uh, prove a theoretical point 
and as well as look at the nanoscale ma nano materials using, uh, you know, high, high resolution PEMs, which comes through the uh, electron and X-ray microscopy group. Well, this is a brief background about uh, CNM and let's get back to our today's topic, tribology. And tribology is very complex. Uh, in a sense, it invites a collaboration between multidisciplinary. And at the end of the talk, I, ex I expect that you will have a fairly reasonable understanding of why I said it is a multidisciplinary field. Because if you look at tribology, we need phys physics majors who can fundamentally study about uh, uh, physicists uh, and coatings and structures. I'll show you in later, later on in my slides where these, uh, these skills are applied in tribology. And we need chemists, material science, mathematics, biology, and as well as engineering. And to solve a single problem in tribology, oftentimes we collaborate with uh, all these majors. Taking the science, fundamental science from the lab to the engineering, uh, to the engineering th so that it can be applied to a real world scenario. And when it comes to, uh, when I asked what is tribology or what are your first impressions about tribology, uh, can anyone guess now what is tribology? Sorry? Study of multiple sciences. Hmm. Anyone else? Collaboration. All right, I'll give it to you. The science and engineering of interacting surfaces in relative motion and the practices related there to in entirety. And if you are thinking it is very complex, I'll uh, give you a simple example. It is, I assume you might have uh, uh, remember talking about friction in your school. When you take your two hands and rub them together, you are actually essentially doing uh, the tribology. In a sense, one surface is stationary and the other surface is moving and you are actually rubbing together. And the science, fundamental science, bit, what is happening between these two hands right now? You know, is my palms are sweaty or dry? It is going to define how smooth I feel. And you can, uh, you can do and see for yourself if you really uh, think it is, it is going to give you any idea of tribology. And the name is actually uh, originated from Greek. Tribo means to rub. And biology actually generally uh, is a branch of knowledge. That's the reason why you have a biology, zoology. And oftentimes, when I talk about tribology, it is typically associated with biosciences bio or life sciences majors, but it is not. And another simple way of to remember what is tribology is to talk about friction, wear, and lubrication. And this was actually, this term was coined by Peter Jost in 1966. The field is, the discipline is 52 years old. It's pretty new. And this, this tribology, in other ways, you can always remember as a cause and effect, and how do you mitigate the cause and effect. The cause is friction, and it is going to end up in wearing out the material, and how do you prevent that using uh, some lubrication methods. And oftentimes, you'll find tribology is defined as study of friction, wear, and lubrication. If you Google what is tribology, that's, uh, that's what it's going to appear mostly. So is it uh, tribology is very new, like a 52 years old? 
or the friction phenomena. It is not. Actually, if you go look back at the history, friction has been studied a long, a long time ago. And one example is uh, the Egyptian pyramids, how they built. And if you observe closely, one person is kind of doing a different, he's, he's doing a different activity than the rest of the people. Can anyone identify? This guy? Okay. Somebody said standing? This person. Yes, exactly. What is he actually trying to do here? He is trying to, yeah, absolutely right. He is trying to reduce friction and help the people to actually save some energy to take it to the further level. And it is not only uh, that, and what is the main mode of transportation in earlier days or ancient times, if you can recall? Sorry? Walking a little bit further, like once you start, we don't have a chariots or, you know, any kind of facilities, but still people use to travel, not by walking, but mostly by horse riding. And you see horseshoe as a like, you know, there's a variety of uh, uh, web, uh, website knowledge, you know, if you say, that he says like it is good luck and other stuff, but you know, the primary reason for why we, uh, why we started using horseshoes is to actually help the horse uh, leg at the end, it is going to hit the ground and the terrain they used to travel is unknown. And it is going to help protect you know, the, uh, the bottom uh, layer of uh, the foot of the horse and it is to provide as a, like a protection shield. And it is also going to help because, as I said, like a terrain. So it can be, it is also going to provide a better traction so that the horse is not going to slip through or fall down. And it is also a best way to actually save your horse. And horse is the uh, number of horses or the horse is considered as a big wealth at one point of time. And the earlier studies of friction was done as early as 15th century. And these are the uh, evidence found out in the history, you know, by archaeologists in the, in the books of a, a prominent scientist. And can anyone guess who that might be? Yes, absolutely. And the scientist need not to be a scientist alone. And after these earlier studies, there is one more or two more prominent scientists studied the friction and came up with the loss of friction. Uh, have you ever seen this free body diagram or inclined plane study? And the loss of friction was proposed by Amonton, who studied the friction in 17th century. And friction is the second law, first law was proposed by him, and later on proposed by one more law was into the Coulomb, or was provided by Coulomb. Which says like when now the friction is directly proportional to the applied load and independent of apparent contact area. Because if you take your hands and put it try to put it together, if you think the total area of your hand is going to touch the total every intricacy of your other hand, it is not true, right? Because there, you will always see say, there is some gaps between your touching surfaces. Uh, that's the essential essence of this second law. Friction is independent of apparent contact area because 
If you think that it is actually the whole surface is going to get in touch, that is not true. So it is not going to depend directly on that one. And the kinetic friction is independent of velocity of the body, but these are only valid for the dry sliding friction. And if you put some oil in between, these are going to change. And friction typically depends on the type of surfaces in contact because we, it is a surface phenomena. And the coefficient of friction for static friction is slightly higher than kinetic friction. As you all uh, agree, pushing a, a block of wood at the beginning is going to be very hard. You have to use more energy. But once you start moving, it is going to be uh, less energy. So that is the difference between static and kinetic friction. And let's get to the point. Okay, this is friction. So how do we reduce, or how, how do we fundamentally uh, mitigate, mitigate or minimize friction? By lubrication. And there are a variety of uh, uh, lubrication methods. And I'll give you a brief overview of types of lubrication, what we use in general. These are fundamentally divided into two, uh, again two. One is liquid based. This, uh, this is like a traditionally we use in automotive engines and you know most of the application where you see oils and greases. And for the solid lubricants, which is actually these are used uh, for extreme environments like space or you know satellites or you know space like NASA used uh, using solid lubricants for a long back for all the space missions. And uh, Strybeck is another uh, prominent scientist who came up with this curve. We, we call it as a, in tribology community, we call it Strybeck curve. And he defined when you have a lubricant, like he, the, assume that these are the two blocks of steel components. And if you have a, enough lubricant in between that is going to be in hydrodynamic regime. And if you have a less, that is called mixer regime, in mixed regime, what happens is this, the asperities of the surfaces are going to get in touch intermittently, not continuously. So there is still going to be some material loss. But when it comes to the boundary lubrication, which is actually a very thin layer of lubricant, like, uh, and oftentimes the asperity to asperity contact or like metal to metal rubbing is going to result in wear debris. That is going to, you are going to lose the material. And most of the applications are uh, false in this boundary lubrication regime. If you take a uh, automotive engine cylinder, uh, the top, dead, uh, top and bottom, these, these are the two areas where it is going to have a boundary lubrication regime. And in, in the middle, it is going to be hydrodynamic. So how do you solve a problem? It is not like uh, simply designing a lubrication mechanism that can work in entirety for the whole engine. Within a component, you have like a variety of uh, friction regimes. So this is, this is what brings us uh, uh, challenges in tribology. And this is what excites every tribologist to solve these issues. And when it comes to lubricants, you often may come across uh, people talking if you end up between um, true tribologists, they are talking about lubricants. Oftentimes, you hear these terms like mineral oil, synthetic oil. Basically, these are means the synthetic oil is like a lab-based oil or like you know, we control oil. We prepare this molecular structure and we prepare these oil. These are called synthetic oils. And mineral oils are from natural crude and they are refined and processed. And oftentimes, when you see like a uh, WD30 or 5W20 or for you know whatever the oil changed in your car. That is actually a synthetic oil with these additives. You can see that we the oil cannot sufficiently uh, provide every production. So we develop these additives like anti-aging, anti-corrosion, EP additives and viscosity improvers. And when it comes to the greases, actually, it is the we add this thickener to the oils with the additives. That is going to make it a little semi-solid kind of material. That is grease. 
and that is used mostly in uh, when there is access to the uh, intricate part is uh, very complicated and you cannot really provide continuous lubricant uh, at the interface. And when it comes to the solid lubricants which are mostly used by uh, NASA or space uh, related applications, uh, these are materials in bulk form. Like uh, I have given a uh, few examples, but these are like actually 2D materials, which I'm going to talk later in later in my slides. But uh, these are actually uh, these are the materials. The MOST is the most prominent material used by uh, for space applications. And if you are wondering, Mars Rover Curiosity has a lot of MOS2 in it to provide the lubrication to facilitate how to navigate, to move and take pictures and to even to move the head, it is going to, because we don't know what kind of environment on, on Mars. So it has been taken uh, into account the hostile environment scenario so that the most of the stuff was designed using some solid lubricants as well. And well, you, we, we reached a stage where steel on steel contact are two surfaces and you provide some lubrication, you solve the problem. But that is not the end of the tribology or like you know solving problem. Because uh, let us say that you hypothetically at 0.2 friction coefficient and with the lubricants you came down to 0.1. And the question pops up, can we make it better? Or how can we protect the surface? This is going to be a chain of thoughts uh, that rises every, every day in a researcher working in tribology or in any other research domain like and how can you improve existing technology? How can you make it better? So in the process, what comes into picture is surface engineering. Surface engineering is a method where we actually modify the surface, provide a, a protective coating or do some boriding or nitriding or, you know, or even texturing. And these are the surface engineering techniques and these individual like the physical vapor deposition or chemical vapor deposition and boriding nitriding, these actually practices are, you know, they have their own research world. So as a tribologist actually uh, you will often co collaborate with these prominent uh, scientists who are like a physics or chemist or you know, material scientists and talk to them and try to find out a solution together for a tri given a tribological problem. And these are the two phys physical vapor deposition coating methods that I, that I used for during my PhD. And as simple as the actually, you know, taking a metal and bombarding with some ions and it is going to sputter the metal from the target uh, to your substrate, whatever. And I will show you some quoted parts examples. And these are like automotive engine components like connecting rod, uh, liners and piston and these piston ring. And these are some gears. And if you think the, this is a, a mostly deals with the mechanical kind of components, it is not. Now, where it comes, biology comes into picture where you have like a hip replacement, knee replacement or you know, shoulder replacement joints. And oftentimes it was uh, suggested to replace your knees uh, after 15 years or 20 years. How do they know basically? Because this, this, these are going to wear out over a period of time. And this is also a complex tribological issue because you are not dealing with man-made lubricants. It is actually naturally you know, built in your body, but once you replace, how do you replace that fluid? Your body has a natural tendency to adjust based on you know, your running or walking, if you take an example of knee. But when you replace the joint with an artificial joint, how do you actually understand the problem and come up with a solution? And if you think everything is uh, related to coatings and surface engineering related to only these uh, complex issues, tribology, it is not. Because oftentimes you will find a beautiful chrome finishing on your faucet, which is actually chromium nitride coating because they can't make your, the entire shoe with the chrome, which is going to be costing you maybe 
too much money. So oftentimes surface engineering is also coding methods is also used to provide productive coding. And even glasses we wear every day. Not most of the people, but some people because of uh, so you can see this, you know, there's like a, if you go to a, if you go for you or for, with a friend or for a family member to a, uh, like a lens craft or any store, they often they ask you like, you know, do you want this uh, additional coating on your glasses? It is going to be a scratch resistant or it is going to, uh, you know, give a low, it is going to protect your eyes from, you know, exposure to screens. And these are all coding methods, actually, surface engineering. So surface engineering itself is a, a, also a, like a big branch of science again. And when it comes to tribology, we try to collaborate with these uh, prominent persons in this as well. And when it comes to the research at Oregon, what I do now is related to tribology, but using 2D materials. Now we have come to a point where traditional lubricants or surface engineering coating methods are no longer going to uh, serve our needs because still we lose about 16 percent of energy generated to come up with uh, combat friction and wear losses. 16 percent is quite a uh, big number. But uh, 52 years ago, when the tribology discipline was coined, or the Peter Jost released the report to the UK government saying that it is a friction and wear is like a prominent cost. That is actually 33% per of GDP of UK. After 50 years, fast forward, we are still, uh, we, uh, we could be able to come up 16% uh, no, savings, but at the, there is still 16% on the table to take it, if you think in other words. And what drives research in tribology in general is improving the energy conversion efficiencies and thereby mitigating the losses. So once you reduce the amount of energy lost in uh, friction, you actually are, the benefit is like you will improve the lifetime of the component and it is again like a low maintenance. And the third aspect is replacing the use of oils and greases because uh, now we are at a stage where we need to come up with a solution that is actually environmental friendly. And we don't put too much uh, uh, hazardous waste into the environment. And this is also one of the prominent factors that drives tribology research. And at Argonne, actually, Argonne researchers showed this macro scale super lubricity using a, a graphene nanodiamond material. And uh, let me give you what I mean by super lubricity. Super lubricity, uh, if you are rubbing two surfaces together, there is never going to be a zero friction. But there is going to be a friction which is unmeasurable in traditional way. And the friction which is 0 0.01 or below is considered a super lubric regime. If you remember this tri-back curve where you have like a boundary lubrication, uh, boundary regime, mixer regime, and a hydrodynamic regime. Similarly, super lubricity is also a regime actually which falls below 0 0.01 friction levels. And when I said like macro scale, macro scale is like, you know, traditional application level loads and speeds. It is a nano material, but it can serve the macro scale purposes. And what they have defined, what they have shown here is like friction reaches to 0 0.004, which is actually, if you look at like 0 0.01 and 0 0.004, there is a 60% reduction or savings in energy. Can we apply it anywhere, everywhere? Actually, right now I'm exploring the possibility of developing a, a method to use these materials to come up with a solution for a company. And uh, this is a, like a TEM image where we see the, as a, if you recall, I said like we do cross-collaborate between the groups and electron microscopy group or 
uh, where we have we use the RTEM facilities and collaborate with them to look at these nanomaterials, how they transform after rubbing for like a certain period of time. And it shows us the, uh, you know, what has happened, how the material was transfer, transformed, or is there any chemical activity, is there a, uh, you know, physical activity. And it turns out in this case, actually we also collaborate with the theory and modeling group uh, to show that it is theoretically also possible. And it turns out that actually these nano diamonds are going to be wrapped by graphene into scrolls. And that is going to provide very low friction at the end of the test. And it is actually done at a uh, macro scale level uh, loads and speeds. This is a big breakthrough came uh, through Argon uh, CNM in 2015. And my research focus is to take the nanoscale materials if you talk about nanoscale materials, you may be thinking about MEMS or NEMS, uh, nano electronic mechanical systems. And the closest possible example I can give you the hard disk interface, where you use a very tiny mono layer of material to produce, uh, to provide low friction. But my research focus is to take this fundamental phenomena occurring at nanoscale using nanoscale materials and to apply to macro scale applications. And the, these are the gaseous, this is uh, the company I'm working with right now, John Crane. And this is also, I'm, uh, we are also exploring the possibility of using this, uh, those 2D materials to apply for wind turbine uh, applications, like bearings and drive trains. Those are the main components of a wind turbine. And if you think about applications, what are the applications of tribology now you, you can think now? I'll give you the first one like automotive engines on cars. Can anyone guess? Yeah, planes is one. Wind turbines. Satellites. Planes. Wind turbines. What else? I have shown those in the previous slides. Yes, and a hard disk. And you see the fidget spinners. If you look up YouTube videos, people say that, you know, okay, if your fidget spinner is not turning good, or, you know, clean it up and do use some WD-40. What exactly you're doing at the point? Or actually cleaning up the surfaces and providing a new layer of lubricant so that it is going for the same energy you give, it is going to rotate faster and longer. Essentially, this uh, the tribology is, is a collaborative effort between a variety of groups to solve a single problem. That is reduce friction and wear and save energy. And what are the examples that you can think of now as an everyday example for tribology? I, what was that? Can you repeat? Touch screen? Yes. What else? The, this is the thing you do every day and without which we may not be walking. Because there is a friction between your surfaces, between two surfaces. 
if there is enough friction then you will stand and in winter often times you slip because there is not enough friction or there is not enough traction in other words and what are the other examples you can think cleaning the knobs or doors whenever you turn it actually you are actually rotating a surface on one another and often times you hear now we are actually entering in going to be there is going to be winter obviously but you will hear the squeaky noises essentially they are dried up or there is not enough lubricant and the coffee grinders these are all everyday examples and even taking notes and if you think uh, or if you will actually the material i am working on graphene actually i assume everybody knows this is a graphite pencil right so and often times when nanoscale materials what we work on a few layers of that the layer actually if you scratch a line of mark a line on the paper often times from that layer we will take a mono layer or two layers that is actually graphene and the, the other perspective is uh, the mono layer of graphene is actually 10 times smaller than your uh, average hair thickness that's the reason why we uh, need microscopes and cross collaboration and to bring the technology from nano scale to macro scale anyways snow plowing or cleaning when wherever there is a relative motion between two surfaces it, there is always going to be a friction and even scatter boards like you know the, the bearing itself has some friction again the on the surface is going to and if you think uh, the tires automotive tires are you know uh, as i said like you know your touch screens you are actually uh, rubbing your finger on a glass and what kind of research might have gone into that one actually because you, if you if you have a if you have a sweaty palms actually you may not be able to sometimes wipe the screen so th because there is a layer actually restricting this uh, transfer of energy or uh, like you know th that's a different field but all in all I what i want to say is tribology is everywhere and uh, the way you look at is going to differentiate how you look at things and i'd like to leave you with fi one final thought be curious ask questions the other way if you remember steve jobs said in once uh, in a speech stay hungry stay foolish he doesn't mean that you know eat a lot of food and you know act like a fool the meaning is to be curious stay hungry in your intellectual capabilities ask questions and stay foolish is don't think you know people think that you are foolish to ask this question just ask the question worst thing happens is you already know or they may laugh at you but you you actually got it off that daunting question in your brain so the essence of that uh, stay hungry stay foolish what i look at personally is to be curious and with that i'll thank you everyone Thank you, Dr. Mutyala. Does anybody have a question? We'll pass the mic around. Um, I want to start by thanking Dr. Mutyala and Brian for bringing him uh, to our uh, institution. We are so fortunate to have you. Um, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, one is would be a technical question uh, about your research, uh, and you can answer them in 
whichever order you prefer. Mm -hmm. The second question would, is a more personal question that I think our students, a lot of my students I see here, it might benefit them a little bit more. Um, so the first question about your research, I was wondering if you could um, tell us a little bit more about uh, what um, exactly does your research involve? You've mentioned about the physical vapor deposition that you did in your PA during your graduate studies. Mm -hmm. um, are you still doing uh, that, that are you still doing the experimentation on these? Uh, you mentioned about working in collaboration with the company, um, trying to find solutions to reduce friction. I think you mentioned the windmills uh, probably. Mm -hmm. um, so are you actually trying to physical, do physical vapor deposition on these and test them? Are you, are you doing the microscopy? In, in what, what aspect of that are you uh, working with? Okay. I'd like to know that. And mm -hmm. then the second question I have is, um, how did you get interested in this field? I mean, were you, uh, when you were five years old, did you wake up one day and you say, I want to be a tribologist? Probably not. No. But <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, for our students, uh, it would be wonderful to know how did you end up where you have ended up as a research scientist at Oregon, mm -hmm. um, and where do you see going from there? Um, so that would give them kind of a way, like you said, to dream, uh, but to have a path, how do you reach, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, to be a research scientist at one of the finest labs in the country, in the world. Mm -hmm. So we would, we would appreciate those, those uh, if you could give us, you know, your journey, about your journey. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Thank you. To answer your first question, I am an experimental tribologist. And for my PhD work, I worked on lubricants as well as PVD coating and test them out for a Timken bearing company. So all along for my PhD work, actually I started seeing the, you know, where, it, where this is going to benefit the company or the society or you know, is going to be end product. But uh, the short answer is like, I'm an experimentalist in tribology, worked on lubricants and coatings, and slowly moved towards nanomaterials. Because as I said, you know, the series of questions I po uh, posted in my slides is kind of related to how I actually, you know, moved through my career when I uh, started my tribology studies in University of Akron. We worked on lubricants, then, uh, then the coatings, and oftentimes you hear that, you know, this is what you need to do, but, you know, if you start asking questions why I need to do th this one, th then you will find the answers, you know, what brings you to that stage. And after that, actually, I was fortunate enough to join Argonne as a postdoctoral scientist uh, to work on 2D materials. Because now, if you see, there is going to be a GF6 regulation uh, in the market, which is uh, kind of saying that you can no longer use thick lubricants. You, can, you have to use thin it down to save some energy. But the moment you thin it down, let us say that uh, you thin it down, you're going to rub the surfaces too much and you're going to lose the material again. So there is no point, it is not going to benefit, it is going to end up in again in a, uh, actually it is not going to serve the purpose of actually initiating the project or initiating the study. So all along I decided to move towards the uh, nano materials because when uh, uh, Dr. Ani Sumanth actually they have shown this uh, macro scale super lubricity, then um, I realized that there is going to be a potential. And this is where I always want to work, to see an end product in the, in, in the society. Uh, I'll be, uh, uh, my personal take on research is, it should serve the community or the world at one point. And if you create a beautiful material for a billion dollar gram, uh, billion dollar for a single gram, Nobody is going to buy it or use it. But if you start asking, like, you know, where can this technology can be used? That can be. Uh, that is the actually driving motor behind uh, my journey through the PhD to here. And this to answer your second question, like, uh, did I really thought about becoming a scientist or you know choosing a tribology as my domain? 
absolutely not. Uh, oftentimes, I found myself when I was in um, fifth grade or eighth grade uh, playing with the bicycle, playing in the sense not taking for a round, but actually I used to take it out, like you know, take it apart and try to put it back before my father comes home, just to say, oh, you know, the irony at the end of the day. And I also used to play with the radios and just out of curiosity, I used to break it and like you know, open it and find a way to get it around and you know, look at things. How does it work? But that curiosity actually taken me uh, to a level where I said that I'll be a mechanical engineer in the beginning. And uh, it is the time where computer science is actually booming. And of course, uh, People also suggest, like, you know, why don't you go for computer science? But always my passion is, or my curiosity is about, you know, how this stuff works in engines and, you know, why the car, you know, goes fast or slow or, like, how does things work? Uh, then I choose mechanical engineering for my, even from my high school stage because I'm from India, so the education system is a little different. Uh, so I did a polytechnic uh, in mechanical engineering. Then a BTEC in mechanical engineering. Then I worked for quite some time in industry, and then I decided to pursue my PhD in mechanical engineering again. And that's how I came to uh, the point where I choose tribology as my uh, research area. Um, I hope I given a brief overview of how I any other questions? Yes. Uh, thank you for coming here. But so, how does like lubricate affect like something like a projectile, like a bullet coming out of like a barrel? Like, would it affect like the accuracy because the the rifling it's not going to be able to spiral completely through, or just how would it affect a projectile in general? It's a good question. Actually, I haven't shown those examples. Uh, just to s not to show, but oftentimes there are companies who work on gun barrels uh, to coat them, uh, you know, to provide the low friction so that it is going to not to or you know improve the accuracy, or like whatever you are referring to. Because uh, the moment you hit the, like you know, pull the trigger, it is going to you know, travel through the barrel, right? So, and the amount of friction between it is going to cut down the speed it can reach, or you know, the reach. Let us say it is going to reach 10 meters. Maybe with the uh, with the ability of surface engineering methods, uh, they can actually make it like a 12 meter or you know, 15 meter or like that's 15 is like too much exaggeration, but you know, 11, 12, like. Uh, but at one point, there are also uh, the potential to use this uh, 2D, like a thin layer of materials, even on the you know, shell as well, so that it is going to be a very friction-free uh, stuff. I think uh, there are companies who are working on those areas with the federal government, with the DOD and uh, you know, Army, and uh, there are things that tribologists work on those stuff as well. That's what I can say right now. Any other questions? Uh, Hello, thank you. Oh, thank you for coming again. I have a question. Oh, what, how would you, how <coughs> what kind of, excuse me, what kind of technology would you use to prevent the material inside pipes from leaking into the water? You can see in the news that there's we have we have there's a we have, we have an aging infrastructure system with which by water and we has led to things like Michigan having contaminated water. Did you, does your work at all to prevent like involve anything how to prevent the materials inside of tubes from leaching into the water? What do you have any do you work do anything like that? Uh, I never worked directly on those areas, but I know people who are working on those areas. It is not like uh, a tribology per se, but uh, it is actually a division now called, we call tribal corrosion. Because the moment there is water with a metal, it is going to corrode over a period of time. 
So, how do you mitigate those, uh, you know, corrode, uh, you know, reduce the corrosion, but at the same time you have to consider the fact that it is not a, like a static uh, corrosion, because if you leave an iron piece outside in the environment in winter and come back or you know, on a rainy day after 10 days you will find rust, but it is not the case in a tube. If you are, you know, there is a water flowing, it is like a dynamic, like it is flowing from point to point, right? Then there's a velocity associated with it. So uh, that is going to drive the uh, chemistry at the interface that can actually, you know, break the bonds and, you know, let the outside, whatever the elements is, leak into the water. But I know people who are working on those divisions or domains, but I don't have a first-hand experience on those. What are the requirements for using the facility? Can anyone use it already? No, it is actually the process is, is, is as simple as like, you know, let, us, let me put it in this way. Like if you are applying for an admission, uh, your application is going to be scrutinized, right? And then if they think that, you know, then they are going to say yes or no. And it is a similar line, but a similar process with Argon, like you will send a user proposal like saying that these are the things I want to work on and, the, and you have to actually provide a reason like, you know, scientifically uh, and, uh, you know, scientific endeavor reason, like why do you want to do this one? And, and at the same time, you have to talk to a scientist at Argon user facilities like CNM or APS and try to find the mutual interest and you will send the proposal, then it goes through the system, then they will uh, let you use the facility if your proposal is approved. Uh, something about the coating technology. My question is, what's the best material for uh, cooking pans, uh, for cooking, uh, the, the best material to coating? That is actually, you'll hear oftentimes this uh, Teflon coated, uh, these cooking pans. Teflon is, I think, as far as I remember, like it is CF free or something in terms of chemistry. But uh, those are actually coated. Uh, I never work directly with anyone on those uh, everyday use, you know, industry. Never talk to them. But all, all I can say is, you know, these are uh, coatings, not DLCs. These are like, you know, uh, compatible with food as well. When it comes to the, that's, that's what brings uh, complexity into any, any technology when, it, when there is a human element involved that is actually a, either directly you are going to consume from that or like, you know, it is going to get into your, like an implant. That's where we look at closely at the, those elements. But all, all I can say is uh, those are like a Teflon coated typically, all those utensils and that is actually provide surf surface, you know, smooth surface. But if you actually, if you experiment with them and if you heat it for longer time, that is going to lose its properties. That's the reason why you, over a period of time, if you take utensils, you are going to see this discoloration coming up and at one point it is going to no longer serve the purpose of non-stick nature. It is going to stick. Any more questions? All right, let's give a round of applause for Dr. Mutal. Thank you.